The M14 rifle, adopted by the Army after 10 years of testing, gives today's infantrymen more firepower than any rifleman in history. The M14 has a shorter barrel and is nearly one pound lighter than its predecessor, the M1, making it easier to handle. The magazine holds 20 rounds, two and a half times as many as the M1. With the flick of a switch, the M14 can be made to fire automatically and pour out the 20 rounds in less than two seconds, which is faster than a machine gun. This sleek rifle is a far cry from Bunker Hill and the Revolutionary War musket. The Brown Best, this one was called, used by the British, but we copied the French Charleville musket model of 1763. To load the flintlock, the soldier poured about 10 grains of black powder into the pan and put the rest of the powder, the ball, and wadded cartridge paper down the smooth barrel. Then he fully cocked the hammer holding the flint. If all went well, the flash in the pan set off the main charge and sent the ball flying in the general direction the musket was pointed. The soldier would be ready to fire again, oh, in the time it takes to say Jack Robinson. 50 times. But we had a secret weapon in the Revolutionary War, a uniquely frontier American rifle. It's known as the Kentucky Rifle. But actually, it was made by the Pennsylvania Dutch long before it found its way to the woodsmen of Kentucky. Its long barrel is rifled or grooved to give the bullet spin and much greater accuracy. Wherever this rifle appeared in the Revolutionary War, Bunker Hill, Saratoga, Kings Mountain, it made a deadly impression on the enemy. However, it and its dead eye users made only intermittent appearances in the war for independence. The model 1861 Springfield was the foot soldier's workhorse of the Civil War. It fired with a percussion cap, replacing the cumbersome flintlock operation. Even though it still required laborious muzzle loading, it was a far more lethal weapon than the musket used in the Revolution. The model 1873 Springfield was used by the cavalry during the Indian Wars. It still fired only a single round, but was an infinitely simpler weapon to operate. It fired a bullet that had its own metal cased cartridge and was loaded at the breech. You veterans of the First World War remember this one, the Springfield 1903. Its magazine held five rounds. After firing, the spent shell was ejected. And the next bullet placed into the firing chamber by one simple operation. But even back in 1903, the Army was looking for a rifle that fired a new round with each squeeze of the trigger. The quest lasted more than three decades before the adoption of the trailblazing Garand M1, semi-automatic. Ask any World War II infantryman, and he'll vouch for the equation. M1 equals VE plus VJ. The M1 yielded only to the new M14 that we just showed you. But it takes more than a good weapon to make an effective rifleman. Marksmanship, for instance. Until the end of the 19th century, the Army drew liberally on a reservoir of sharpshooters. Hunters men who used the rifle for their livelihood. But the myth of natural marksmen disappeared along with the frontier. Marksmen had to be made. The Army authorized its first systematic target practice in 1858. Its importance and refinements accumulated through the years. But an effective rifleman needs more than a good weapon and the ability to use it. During the early periods of shoulder arms, in order to concentrate inaccurate fire, this was the standard infantry formation. The word platoon sometimes meant volley fire. After the men had fired, they made a bayonet charge. But these kneeling and standing ducks would not last long enough against today's weapons 
to make a charge. Frontal assault was unavoidable by the nature of World War I. But unlike these doughboys, today's riflemen are taught to keep moving on the attack. The stopping and bunching up invites murderous counterfire. In World War II, analysis showed, attacking GIs were so preoccupied with battle chaos and anxieties for survival that only about 25% used their weapons. Today's riflemen are trained to utilize every bit of the tremendous firepower given. In the Korean War, still another problem was discovered. Troops trained under ideal conditions recognized only one-third of concealed enemy targets in combat conditions. Rifle marksmen now are made through a method called train fire. Riflemen know at once how well they're doing, because targets fall when hit properly. Riflemen are taught to recognize and hit concealed targets. In order to equip men for potential reality, the Army emphasizes realism in its training. To show you what we mean, let's turn to a brand new training film. The story of the 3rd Platoon, D Company, 87th Infantry. The platoon has just received orders to carry out the still basic job of the military, attack the enemy and destroy him. With platoon leader Lieutenant Hadley rests primary responsibility for success and for the security of his 43 men. Three rifle squads of 11 men each, a nine-man weapons squad and the platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class Brooks. Take over, Sergeant. I'm going to get the attack order. As soon as you reach the assembly area, recheck the ammo. And make sure the men clean and check their weapons. Also, be sure the men you post to security stay alert. Now, we should move prior to 10 o'clock. I'll send Roberts to guide you and the squad leaders forward. Yes, sir. Captain Weber's D Company has been assigned to clearing the enemy from a strongly defended ridge as part of a renewed assault by the division. The attack begins at 10 hundred hours. We will attack with two platoons online and one in reserve. The first platoon will attack to seize the southeast portion of the ridge here. Lieutenant Hadley, your third platoon will attack and seize the left portion of the objective and be prepared to continue the attack to seize the high ground here on order. You have a frontage of 300 meters on the line of departure from this trail junction. Now your left flank is open. An ambulance will be in the vicinity of the second platoon. Aid station and company distribution point will remain in the same location. Emergency signal to shift indirect supporting fires, Green Star Cluster. Initially, I'll be with the second platoon. The time is now 0736. Any questions? Sir, could we have the artillery mark the last round on the objective? Yes. Carter, make sure your artillery people mark their last round. Find out what color smoke and let me know. I'll have the 4.2 mortars shift their fires first. Yes, sir. Any other questions? No, sir. No, no, sir. Well, that's it then. I'll be at my OP at 0815 for final coordination. Lieutenant Hadley has about two hours to organize the best way to seize from a determined, well-dug-in enemy a ridge neither he nor his rifleman ever saw before. The formidable task becomes manageable by following six vital steps. The first, with no time to lose, is begin planning. Then make arrangements. 
make reconnaissance, then complete plan of attack, and issue attack order to squad leaders. Supervise the attack. First, Lieutenant Hadley decides how he will allot his time. Then begins preliminary planning of the attack. After arranging to meet with the squad leaders and coordinating plans with other platoon leaders, it's time to study the battleground. Let's see now. If we move up on the right, initially we'll be in the open. That's bad. But there's good concealment once we cross the road and it's a direct route to the objective. But we'll be approaching the enemy from the front and the terrain looks pretty rough, so control will be difficult. How about straight up the middle? Initially, we'll be in the open here, too. It's the most direct route, but it's a low ground approach, and we'd have to hit them from the front. We get clobbered that way. Now, what about the left? It's a long route, but we can get up to high ground fast. There's good cover and concealment all the way. Then we can hit them from the flank. Yes, that's it. With his attack plan formed, the lieutenant briefs his squad leaders, first by showing them the terrain, then by issuing his detailed attack order. Now, here's the story. The enemy holds the ridge with an estimated reinforced rifle platoon. They're well dug in. Our company will attack with two platoons abreast to seize the ridge. First platoon on our right will seize the southeast portion of the ridge. Our left flank is open. Mortars from the combat support company and direct supporting artillery will begin preparatory fires and smoke at H minus five. 81 millimeter mortars in general support, will begin preparatory fires at H minus two. Our platoon will attack at 10 hundred hours to seize the left portion of the objective, 900 meters to our front. We will cross the line of departure in platoon column and move along this route. First squad, weapon squad minus one machine gun, second squad, third squad. One machine gun will support the attack initially from a position in the vicinity of the OP. We will assault from the right flank of the objective with three squads followed by the rocket launcher team. Both machine guns will support the assault from this knoll. Sergeant Jackson. Lieutenant Hadley now spells out the job of each squad to Sergeant Jackson of the first squad, Sergeant Harrison of the second squad, Sergeant Leonard of the third squad, and Sergeant Corelli of the weapons squad. The rifle squads are divided into two five-man teams, the smallest unit. The weapons squad packs two machine guns and a 3.5-inch rocket launcher, or bazooka. The tentative assault line is at the base of the objective about here. Initially, I'll move at the head of the weapon squad minus. I plan to be with the second squad during the assault. Sergeant Brooks, you'll move at the head of the second squad. Follow the first squad in the assault. The time is now 0849. Any questions? No, no sir. No, sir. All right, I'll be in this vicinity if you want me. 
Move out. Sergeant Brooks, when you get back to the assembly area, check the number two machine gun and make sure the barrel's been replaced. Have the men move out by 0940. Yes, sir. Well, let's get rid of this. Okay, let's go. The lieutenant has left his squad leaders ample time to form their own plans and instruct their men before the platoon moves out at 0940. At H-5, the artillery opens up. Along with mortars from the combat support company. At H-2, D Company's 81mm mortars go into action. Ten hundred hours, the attack commences. The first squad leads the platoon across the line of departure. The enemy is 1,000 yards away, waiting. Dispersion is an ally of the attackers. The riflemen advance more than half the appointed distance when suddenly... First squad's alpha team returns fire while the rest of the platoon takes cover. Sergeant Jackson of the first squad discovers the source of the enemy fire, a well-hidden outpost. He believes that the platoon cannot continue attacking until the resistance point has been eliminated and his squad cannot do the job by itself. He radios his report to Lieutenant Hadley. The platoon leader goes to the advance point to size up the situation and decide what action to take. He decides to use one squad to pin down the enemy outpost with rifle fire, while the rest of the platoon maneuvers toward it from the left. radios his orders while the platoon sergeant and all squad leaders listen. Four, place your machine guns and rocket launcher to the right of the first squad. Five, stay with the fire support but displace forward and rejoin the platoon as soon as your fires are masked. Acknowledge. Hadley then instructs the mortar forward observer to have his fire shifted to the outpost. And that instruction is relayed. He then reports what he has done to company commander Captain Weber and gets his approval. Here we see another innovation, an immediate battlefield response to an unexpected situation through a radio communications net that links all elements of the platoon and the platoon with other units. screen of supporting fire, Lieutenant Hadley leads the rest of the platoon to close with the enemy.
maneuver element nears the enemy position, Lieutenant Hadley signals a platoon line formation for the assault. Assault fire is characterized by volume, accuracy, and violence of action. Riflemen fire aimed shots every two or three steps at known or suspected enemy targets. The M14s on full automatic fire from the hip in short bursts, covering the squad front. For personal protection, the riflemen wear body armor. The support fire teams now move forward to join the assault force. And the enemy outpost is taken. Lieutenant Hadley reports to Captain Weber. And the platoon resumes its advance against the main objective. Enemy artillery and mortars have other ideas. When an attack force is hit by such fire, it must move quickly through or around the impact area. The platoon approaches the assault line. Lieutenant Hadley orders his machine guns into position to support the attack. Then, once again, he orders the platoon line formation for the final assault. positions himself for optimum control of this final phase. Full control, as we have seen, is an earmark of today's infantry operations. It is the antidote for the nemesis of battle since the dawn of history, confusion. As our troops near the enemy line, supporting fires are shifted and the enemy takes advantage of the situation. are today's riflemen in action. taken, the platoon immediately prepares to press its advantage or repel an enemy counterattack. This is where the tradition of American riflemen stands today carried forward by great advances in weapons, training, and tactics, but still relying on the same character of the men. If there is a moral to all that we have seen, it's this. Despite sophisticated weapon systems and thunderclap warheads, land still is seized and held by men on foot with the weapons they can carry. Thank you.